good afternoon, antique viewers. It is nice to see you again. This is George. I'm the Antique Nomad at the Antique Nomad on Twitter, Periscope, Instagram, and Facebook. And we are here for the second of the trifecta. Uh, there's a little route I like to take on the Lower Ohio River. We've been to Evansville. We did that. You can look at uh, that uh, video that posted earlier today. Uh, we didn't make it to New Harmony to our friend and fellow scoper Cindy Smotherman's place in New Harmony, but that's uh, just to the north of us. And then the bottom of the triangle is Sturgis, Kentucky, not Sturgis with the uh, big bike rally, although they do have a big bike rally here in Sturgis, Kentucky, the little too. Sturgis. The Little Sturgis, yes, exactly. Uh, but we are here at the Sturgis Antique Mall, uh, which is in an old uh, building here next to uh, wonderful stuff. They uh, like to put a lot of stuff outside, so we've got these really great paper mache horses. They feel like paper mache, but they're probably resin of some sort for outdoors. And we're going to come on into the mall and show you some of the cool stuff here. This is another place I really like to go when I'm in the area because they always have nice things. It's well presented and they've got a big variety. So let's go in and see. So one thing that you'll notice sometimes when you're in a small town is that the antique mall becomes the de facto museum for that town. And this is definitely one of those. If you uh, look to uh, this direction here, you're going to see a large variety of items that actually are from Sturgis from the old days. Uh, this is, is in effect donated and loaned items from local people or people who had things from here. None of this is for sale, but it shows all of the pamphlets from all the old stores. This was the old bank safe. Sturgis is a town that maybe had a thousand people at its peak. Um, so it, there was about one of everything. We've got all the old uh, trophies from the old uh, high school. The, they were big in track at one time in the 20s and 30s, won a bunch of trophies. Uh, we've got the old glee club stuff. Um, so it's really a lot of fun. And if you're in an area that you're not familiar with in a little town, a lot of times the antique stores will be where the, it affect the museum is. Um, walking in here, one of the first things that uh, we'll try not to trip over, but I think is really neat, is uh, this guy here. This is the space trike. It did all sorts of funny maneuvers and you could make it go sideways and you steered it from the back. This was made by Mattel that makes Barbies and all that kind of stuff. And this is a 60s piece. Um, I've never seen one of these before. I don't think very many of them were made because they were expensive when they were new, so there's not a lot around now. So that's kind of a fun thing to see. Uh, then over here, I wanted to uh, point out, oh yeah, this uh, groovy hat here. What do you think about this? How does it look? Put it on. <laughs> Is that I a hat? Oh, it's me. in a case. Yes. Yeah, so, well, it's actually in a in its case, and it's an old uh, fraternal organization. I think this was uh, Knights of Pythias or Columbus or one of those. Um, Columbus. Thank you. Yes, it's good to have other people who know stuff around because I can't know everything. Uh, so Knights of Columbus, and it's uh, great. It's got the original presentation case. That's a lot of fun. Um, behind you here, and this is something that's controversial in some quarters, but uh, very collectible, is a whole case full of black memorabilia. Now, some of these are um, depictions that are um, uh, that were definitely all considered cute at the time. Some of them are uh, very cartoony by our standards now, but there are a lot of people who collect this, and actually a lot of my collectors for this are people who are preserving this for historic purposes, mostly black folks actually. Um, but it is a, definitely an area of collecting in and of its own. The shakers all were made in Ohio back in the uh, uh, 40s and 50s. Um, then the Japanese started making a lot of these little planters and the redware pieces. Um, you've got stuff, uh, this is an old uh, Mammy Shanty, it was a fairly uh, famous restaurant in Atlanta, Georgia back in the day. This is all politically incorrect now, but at the time it was uh, actually just considered part of the landscape, and so there are collectors for that for sure. Now there's another thing behind us made in Kentucky that might surprise you for you modernists, and that is this disco ball. Woo! <laughs> and here we are. And, uh, Paula asked if we bought much today. Uh, yeah, actually, we did buy quite a lot. Uh, we went to a big estate sale, too, so we'll do a haul video later and show you what we got. We got some really cool things today. So. That's the signal. Uh, yeah, let us know, by the way, we're in a, when we're in these old buildings and in a, a little town out on the uh, outskirts of things like this, sometimes the signal isn't great, so please let us know if you can hear us or if it gets fuzzy. We'll try to move to a place where it's still audible. 
Um, anyway, the, uh, the disco balls were made and are still made in Louisville, Kentucky, believe it or not. That is where the disco ball came from. Uh, and so here is a really colossal one from the period right above my head here. And uh, it is definitely right out of the late 70s and pretty amazing thing to have in your house if you have room for it. Um, cool uh, old uh, life insurance sign. This one is actually uh, John Hancock, probably from about 1940s on the big wrought iron hanger there. Unusual thing. They have a lot of stuff cool hanging over our heads here. I just noticed this metal plane, which is uh, just a decorator piece, but uh, it uh, was by uh, Gatton, and that's kind of a neat thing too that somebody made to hang up in a man cave at one point, and I'm sure that's where it'll go again. Um, coming down this way, we've got some, there's some cool stuff back here that I wanted to uh, show you. I had a chance to come in and take a look at a few things ahead of time this time. And I wanted to point out this uh, deck chair here. This is a, uh, deck chairs like this are uh, very popular collectibles now because they fold up easily and people can take them in an RV or camping. But the Piedmont advertising was really unusual. This was back in the, uh, right at the beginning of the Depression, and they were trying to get uh, their name out, and so they figured, oh yeah, we'll put these things out, and the newsreels will have them, and our name will be in the background. Uh, they'd have them uh, all sorts of places. The only place you wouldn't have seen this where they used these chairs was at the uh, tent revivals, because those were mostly held by people who were not big on the smoking thing. So um, kind of a rare thing to find now. I've actually always wanted to own one, and I have yet to have one, so maybe this will be mine. Um, let's see, around the corner here, I noticed that there were, uh, uh, there's a space over here that's got some pretty interesting things too. Sorry about uh, walking off, it's uh, getting used to all this. And again, let us know if there's any signal or sound problems, please. Um, but in here I noticed something. I occasionally um, watch the uh, feeds from a gal in Pennsylvania who calls herself Crazy Lamp Lady, and I saw these Hager lamps and thought of her immediately. Hager was made up in Illinois. They just went out of business a few years ago, but this would be a piece from the 50s, as you can imagine, with the panther, a big popular motif then. And there's a pair of them here. Paula is asking, what types of items do you collect? Oh, hi, Paula. Well, that's a good question. Um, I personally collect a lot of Floridiana because I spend my winters down there doing shows and sales. I collect a lot of um, things related to Studebakers because I've driven five of them over the years. I got into old cars when I was a really little kid and always wanted to have one, and then I grew up and got a bunch. Um, I collect things related to uh, ephemera from uh, places my family has been or we're from Battle Creek, Michigan, Seattle, Washington, St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I collect coins and stamps. I've done that since I was about five or six years old, so I guess I came by this honestly. Uh, I collect Pilgrim Cameo glass, Manhattan glass. Uh, there's a lot of things I collect personally. I'm sure I'm leaving out a whole bunch, but that's just off the top of my head. I like Don Blanding books and uh, illustrations by that particular artist. And uh, at some point, I'm going to try to do some little, uh, some sort of a video from my place, and I'll show off some of my collections. Um, let's see. So back here, coming around, I wanted to point out, even though it's a little ahead of season, I wanted to point out the aluminum tree here because this one is an original one from the 50s and it has the pom-poms on it. And the pom-poms are definitely more desirable than the ones without and you don't really see reproductions with the pom-poms. So if you see this, you know it's an old one. She said your home must be interesting. Oh, it's kind of fun. I have a good time. I, uh, I enjoy it. I don't see it often because I'm on the road doing this a lot, but um, I do enjoy, uh, enjoy it. And I imagine that uh, yours and a lot of our viewers are too. And, you know, if you folks ever want to private message me or send a picture of something you're curious about that you've got, I'd love to talk about it. So, uh, anyway, these trees sell for about $20 per foot now. So this one's priced at $75, and it's a four-footer. And so that's a pretty reasonable price for it these days. 
and then uh, let's see. We'll come around the corner here, and mm. let's see. Kathy if we says can. she needs that tree. She does. Ah, yes. Well, I uh, I needed it, but then I uh, found a six footer, so I, I've got mine down. But uh, and I've got the color wheel and the whole thing, and so uh, yes, I have a lot of fun with that every year. I'm kind of getting used to the walking backwards thing, so excuse me if I seem a little awkward here, but I'm trying to make sure that uh, we uh, can all go together. Let's go back here for a minute, because there is something back here that we don't see often. Sketchy signal, maybe, but we'll... Well, we'll see how the signal does. Again, please tell us if we disappear. Um, but I wanted to show that they have an old-time pinball machine here, and uh, this one needs a new glass, which isn't a big deal, but... Uh, these 50s pinball machines are something that uh, we don't really see for sale much anymore. Most of these went into collections back in the 70s and 80s, and so to find one on the market is really hard today. Um, this one does work, and it's got the old wood rails. And you'll notice, actually, if you look, that it doesn't have flippers, because the original ones didn't. The original ones were actually gambling devices. It was a Okay, we're, we got to go back. Okay, out we'll go back out where we can see some other stuff now. Hopefully the signal will improve when we get out here. But um, let's go this way. And we'll come around the corner here and take a look. And um, I think we'll go this direction because there was something back here I thought was interesting that I could uh, show you. So let's... Uh, okay, thanks Paula for letting us know. How is it now? Is it any better? If it isn't, we'll go to another part of the store. So we're going to keep on trying here. Um, if this is working, I'd like to show some things here. So hopefully you're seeing this still. At the uh, On the previous video earlier today, we showed a little Fenton base. And here we have the lamp in the lime green that goes with. And uh, these are from the 1960s and 70s. Fenton lamps are actually very expensive and very collectible now that the company's out of business. These should sell in the $200 to $400 range, depending on the pattern. And we also have a whole bunch of original issue, actual jadeite. Anchor Hawking um, made the uh, jadeite glass and Fire King made jadeite. And these are uh, the older pieces here. Hey Paula, how's it going? Give us some hearts if you can hear us and see us. Yeah, that'd be good to know. And then, uh, so the shell is an older piece from the late 40s, early 50s. You don't see much. Um, you rarely see the charm, which is the square plates in the jadeite. That's actually very popular with the modernists right now. And really all of the jade green is popular because um, uh, it um, really took off about 20 years ago when Martha Stewart started collecting it and a whole lot of people got interested in it then. So we're going to move on and hopefully you'll be it's able to hear us. Um, well, let's go towards the front and see if that's any better then. Because we really would like to... Uh, Can't hear you when you're facing We'd forward. actually like to tell you a little more about stuff if we can find a place that we can do that. So. Um, let us know when we're a little more audible and we will go back to it. Okay. Okay, is that better? <laughs> better now? Okay. I don't know. Well, we'll let's, let's give it a try. Um, in here is something I thought was interesting. Uh, for best results, use dictator flour. In the 1920s and 30s, dictator was like dictating fashion and telling you how you should be and your deportment, and dictator was considered someone who was of status. Well, then, of course, a certain dictator or two came to power in the 1930s, Hitler and Mussolini, and the term dictator fell out of favor and stopped being used. So when you see this, Studebaker even had a car called the dictator. Uh, so whenever you see something that's pronouncing itself as dictator, it was considered a good thing when it was done. It just seems really curious to us now that anybody would call anything that. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting, but in 1921 it had a different meaning. Um, this is a cute piece to me because uh, this reminds me of where I'm from in the Northwest. This is actually Mount Hood in Oregon. It's a 1920s uh, tinted print in a frame, original frame. and. These were very popular at the time for travelers. It was the first time people had cars and could really go on their own to anywhere. They weren't uh, stuck going only where the train went or where you could go on a boat. Um, so these sort of tourist prints were popular all over the country. If you had a pretty attraction, then you took a picture of it and someone sold them by the roadside and 
that's where these came from. And I might take that back to Oregon because I think someone there would understand it better than here. Another thing that's kind of fun, again, there's a lot of farm related in this part of the country and we've got the old DeKalb sign here. You would see these on the old feed stores as well as the fence rails along old farms in the Midwest and uh, actually all over the West Coast too, DeKalb was pretty wide uh, spread. And um, I believe that it's named for DeKalb, which is the town that Cindy Crawford is from in Illinois. And so let's see here, what else do we have that's interesting? Um, let's kind of move towards the front of the store. I know there were some things there I thought were uh, fun to show. Still here. Still here. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. I'm glad you uh, were able to stick with us. This booth is fun because somebody has really done a 50s theme here and tried to make it really feel like a 50s kitchen. And I think that that's a lot of fun. You've got the original um, uh, red and white um, kitchen queen, and this is probably 1940s uh, or 30s. This is before people had cabinets built in, and a lot of people I've noticed who want a more open plan in a kitchen are starting to use pieces of furniture like this again instead of building permanent cabinetry everywhere. Um, so that's kind of a nice thing to see. Uh, we've also got a lot of uh, uh, fun screen printed kitchenware, the uh, apples, the canister set with the, uh, I think those are zinnias? Am I right about that? I'm terrible with flowers. I really should learn more. Um, anyway, they're pretty red flowers. <laughs> um, and they've got a lot of bright kitchenware and then this gal dressed up like uh, Lucy doing the serving. Um, the pink canister set over here is a fun thing from the uh, 1950s as well. And now that pink is a big de decorator color again, I imagine these won't last long. And then one thing that doesn't really match but I think is interesting is the alligator purse with the face. These are something that uh, were sold in Florida and Cuba back uh, when people could go to Cuba more easily. And this one has the face on it. Some people find that quite macabre. Other people think it's quite fascinating, but they are good sellers regardless if they're in good shape and have their eyes, which this guy does. And so that's something very different than 40s and 50s kitchen, but it was a fun thing to see in a booth. Um, so we're gonna go up front where hopefully the reception will improve. And let's see what we've got up here. Um, this is nice to show just because we don't see many of these in this country. This is a French vitrine, and a vitrine is basically a glass front cabinet, usually with a curved glass. Uh, but this one has been done in what they call a chinoiserie, so it's trying to look Asian even though it's made in France. Uh, so chinoiserie is um, generally English-made things that we're trying to look Asian. Paula's asking if you ever go picking in Rhode Island. You know, I was just in Rhode Island about uh, a month ago. I was in Newport, and it's the first time I've ever been to Rhode Island. And boy, what a great town, and I would love to go back there and do some antique picking. I didn't get a chance. I only got to, to look a little bit in Connecticut. Uh, but I've got family in Connecticut, so I'm going to try to get up there again and uh, look around. And uh, where is good to pick in Rhode Island? I'd love to get your uh, thoughts on that because I would love to come and see a new place. Uh, Rhode Island's a great place to look for things like costume jewelry, which they made a ton of there and is very collectible now. So definitely high on my list of places to go, but I haven't really uh, been to any antique stores there or, or anything yet. Um, let's see what else we can uh, point out up here. Uh, this is, again, modernism pops up in places you don't expect. Uh, Lucite chandeliers like this with the pieces that uh, hung from the 70s, very popular in Florida, very popular on the coast with modernists. But at one time they were popular everywhere and I do find these in Kentucky and I've brought a few to other places from here and they actually go very well in some parts of the country. Um, Let's see, um, I think in the interest of keeping our signal, I'm gonna stay to this side of the store and let me see, I wanted to point out, oh, this is something over here that I thought was kind of interesting because it's big. It's again, uh, the paddle wheel, it's again a piece that uh, somebody made as a display or something to put uh, uh, in a man cave or this sort of thing. It's uh, the kind of thing that my dad would have made back in the 70s if he'd had the talent. Uh, he tried. And so it's kind of fun to see one that was successful here. 
Um, we've also got, uh, again, a lot of uh, crockery like we see in this part of the country. But let's look at mixing bowls, because this is something we see around here, too, that's very popular in this area, and actually popular all over the country. Um, so this one is, um, a lot of these are by McCoy. Uh, they're what they call yellowware because of this yellow cast to the uh, buff clay. So that's the natural color of the clay. Um, this one's a McCoy with the, or I'm sorry, no, this is Watt pottery. We saw some Watt pottery at the last store in Evansville, and this is an example of that. So if you like more to the primitive and rustic in kitchenware, uh, then these are the mixing bowls for you. However, if you prefer modernism or things that are more bright, happy uh, colors from the middle of the century, then Pyrex is probably where you want to go. And there's a couple of shelves of interesting Pyrex pieces right here. You've got the primaries from the 50s and 60s. You've got some of these uh, patterns here, uh, 1960s era. Uh, and then the Harvest Gold, of course, is going to be a 1970s. I think this is called uh, Crazy Daisy. And uh, in fact, I know it is because there's an antique mall in Louisville named after that pattern. And uh, we'll go there sometime, too, I'm sure. Um, She's asking, did you go to Putnam, Connecticut? I did not go to Putnam. I Where did I go in Connecticut? Um, I went to Ridgefield, Danbury area in the western part of the state. <laughs> and actually, I would have done more picking there, but when I went to see my aunt, she had this great collection of old scales from her old house that she wanted to get rid of, and it filled the car, so I couldn't really buy any more. Um, let's see if there's She says her 87-year-old dad <clears throat> worked at Coro. Coro, really? And my mom has, t her mom has tons. Oh, that is so cool. Coro is a really great jewelry maker, and I'll bet she's got some really fun pieces. Um, Coro, I wish I had something to show you, actually, because as soon as you mentioned, I think, oh, they made so many great things. Coro's, uh, some of their best stuff in the Second World War, they made the pieces that uh, they came up with something called Duet, where it has a back and you could put two pins on it, it would turn into a bigger brooch, and or you could separate them and wear them separately. They had uh, what they called tremblers, where they had, like, it'd be a flower, and then the stock would come out, and the little stones on the end would shake when you walked around. Um, so Coro was very inventive, and they did a lot of really great stuff. They did a lot of thermoset in the 1960s. Of course, you probably know all this since your folks work there, but that's really neat to um, meet someone who has an actual connection to that, because... Um, you know, though so many of the American businesses have been gone for a while now that, uh, you know, we're losing some of our nostalgia for it because nobody connects to it in that way. So it's really cool that you have a family connection. Um, let's see, I think to, um, I think to wrap up here, let's find a interesting thing that we can put in the background. And I would say, actually, I like this stove right here. Um, they had a neat enameled stove that was green and uh, ivory from the uh, 1920s in here, as well as a couple of these old pot bellies. Uh, but this one's a nice one because it's got um, all of its parts in the door. The only thing uh, it might have had originally would have been mica, or what they called ising glass, which were little strips of mica that would have filled these. Uh, and a lot of times those broke out. Uh, but this is going to be from about 1900. And if you're restoring an old house or this sort of thing, these do crank out a ton of heat as opposed to a modern pellet stove or that sort of thing. So some people actually do put them back in their houses and use them every, uh, every cold day there is. Um, anyhow, I really am enjoying uh, bringing... What's that now? Down. Okay, no, yes. To the ah, okay, thank you. My <laughs> cameraman is instructing me here. Okay, so for the money shot. Uh, anyhow, I just want to thank you all for joining us again. We will do a haul video because we had a good day and found a lot of fun things, and we'll come back to you and show you all of that. And it's nice to be out here broadcasting again. Thanks for joining us, and uh, stick with us. There will be more.